back in the early 1960s when most men looked like this. Kits were available for really cool things. In this particular case, an Allison 501 turbo shaft. This particular kit has been reprised again as a fundraising project. I don't have anything to do with it. However, let's unbox and build some plastic models because you would be surprised how remarkably well gunsmithing skills translate to building plastic kits. Let's go. Well, let's get into this box here. Unboxing is always my favorite part. We have instructions how to build this. And I'm telling you, man, this instruction manual, I've been in this box before, but this instruction manual, man, now this is having a flashback to my childhood. My, uh, my old man flew, uh, flew jets in the 50s, and the first model kit I ever built when I was four years old was of an X-15. Yeah, buddy. So anyway, um, we're looking through. We have actual instructions here. These will become important later because this particular engine actually has rotating parts in it. So they're having you um, oil things as well as glue them together. No painting here. Um, just uh, straight up assembly and try to not break anything. All right. So in this particular thing, they, they've re-released this as kind of a STEM kit. It's uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and, and trying to get people, you know, encouraged to pursue the finer arts. We have decals in here. And I'm sure we'll use these. These go on the props. There are some other things here that go. And then there is a, an explanation of how a turbo shaft works. And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of insight into that from my level of understanding and how I used to explain it to my mechatronic students. Well, there's four colors in this thing. And the best I can tell, blue parts, the, the cold air section, the induction turbine, the, uh, the inside casing, the gearboxes are all in blue. And these are all of our blue parts. We'll set those off to one side. The hot section parts all appear to be in orange. So we're just unbagging. We are not cutting anything loose from the sprues. That is death. Those of you that have ever taken one of these kits and just torn it all the way out and cut all the parts off, sometimes the pictures they draw inside the instructions are not that good. So there we have the A, and here we have the L's, and so this is for the, the, we'll put this over here. Gray parts appear to be fuel and accessories. This has the gear case, the fire cans, all the stuff that's on the outside. Propeller blades. This thing has variable pitch propeller blades in the kit. Be very interested to see how we're going to pull that off. Okay. There we go. We've got, we have propeller blades over there, gear cases. Um, we have, I'm believing the power section turbines, but I'm not sure. We'll look at all that. It'll tell us as we go. And then finally down here in the black, we have the boots for the propellers, fuel lines, um, all the accessory cases and the stand. And the stand is going to be important because this is going to be difficult to work on unless you can stand it up. So there you go. That's the inside of the box. We're going to reconfigure the cameras and uh, get back on with this. So from here on out, as we move through the steps, I'm going to go ahead and source and clip the parts off the sprues. We're not going to do the, the, the clip the parts off the sprues every time. We'll source the parts out and then I'm going to go ahead and assemble them. And in this particular case, there is a forward and aft boot on this propeller, which is an aerodynamic fairing, which fits over the back end of this. There are two different parts, and the way they've got this located, let's see if I can get it for you. These black parts are a real pain in the butt here. There's a stud right there on it, right there. Here we go. And that stud forces the part to line up correctly. So... We, we cannot put it on this way. We have to put it on that way. 
So the guys that do these kits leave you these little clues. Now let's see if we can get that to snap over there. There we go. You heard it snap and get in tight. And then while I've got this here, I'm going to put a small drop of cement on it. Again, this cement runs and it goes everywhere. So what you don't want to do is have a, uh, a cement fingerprint. Don't do that. That's like a, a, a carpenter whacking a board with a nail. It's called an amateur mark. Don't do that. All right, so now the other side of the boot comes on. Now these were on the sprue in matched sets. So that will just clamp on there. So this particular boot is an aerodynamic guard for the propeller. Another name for a propeller is an air screw. And this thing literally screws itself through the air. So on the continuum of turbo shaft engines, you go from the pure turbojet, which gets all of its work done by blowing air out the back end of it. Very hot air, very high energy air, but blowing the air out the back all the way down to a turbo shaft, which is moving an effector, like a propeller, helicopter blade, screw on a boat. The US Navy has a couple of fairly large gas turbine powered destroyers that go like stank, um, or a helicopter, or any other way. It's a vastly different way to do it than, say, a reciprocating engine, and I'll get to that. Step three is a simple aft spinner plate mount. There's a locating tab inside here. You can see that locating tab right there. They're, they're trying to give you clues as how to put this thing together right. Um, I'm going to tell you the last plastic model that I built, I built while I was waiting to go in the Navy. And it was 1982, 1983. And I built a Tamiya F-14. Now, this was before... Um, the whole Top Gun thing where all of a sudden everybody had the need for speed. But it was an awesome model and God was that thing expensive. I seem to remember that model costing almost $60 in 1980s money. But And it took me almost a full two months to build it. But boy was that thing spectacular. Well, we're going to roll out of step three here and into step four. And in step four... We're going to have gearing that's associated with this propeller on how we're able to change its pitch and therefore its ability to bite the air. At high speeds, you want a lot of pitch, big bite, lots of forward motion. But at low speeds, you want the propeller down to where it's not taking a very large bite of air, but it gets a really good grab on it. When it says lubricate, we're going to go ahead and lubricate with just a gun oil because, well, that's what I do for a living. But what they're, what they're asking you to do is put a little bit of oil here where this plastic runs on this plastic. And we're just going to put a touch on each one of the gears here. And then this will run down over the top of this. And I'll get my hands out of the way here in just a second. And what this will allow is, is that as this turns, all those individual shafts will turn. Difficult to demonstrate. Let me get an angle here and get a little bit of light on it. There we go. That'll work. So as this center shaft turns, these outer ones turn also. Like I said, almost impossible to demo. There it is. But we'll put some blades on it and see what we come up with here. So in the next two steps, we're reading out in front here and we're seeing a match line on the spinner and there's actually an, an arrow right on, above my thumb. You see there, now they're out, right? What you want to avoid doing is what's called cookbooking a procedure. And this is what cookbooking looks like. To defuse the bomb, it is very important to use the correct tools and not be colorblind. In this instance, we see three colors, a red, a blue, and a green. Cut the green wire. But first ensure that the red wire has been previously cut or the weapon will detonate. Don't read procedures like that, okay? You've got to stay 
several things out in front to make sure that you're not going to hose yourself up. All right. So that's just, I don't know, brought to you by, there was an episode of MASH where Radar O'Reilly is calling the instructions out. Okay, here we go. So what this is saying is, apply cement to these four places, and this is marked. So this goes over the top of the propeller here. And what they want is they want cement only where the rotating parts aren't. So we'll do that. We'll put a little dollop of cement here and this hits and takes off underneath because of the capillary action. Then I'm gonna roll around and go 100 degree, 180 out. I'm gonna put a little drop of cement there and watch it run under. Resist the temptation to rub that with your finger. Ah, gadzooks. Bruno's over there going, no, don't do that. There's a part of your brain that when under intense physical stimulation or emotional stimulation, it hits the record button. I think it's called your hypothalamus. So when you record something at incredibly high speed and you play it back at normal speed, it sounds like this. No. So I'm switching over to the thicker glue here because we have to attempt to do some glue joints here that we, the, cat, the consequences of keeping the moving parts from moving are pretty thick. So what I'm gonna do is take a drop of this cement and this cement is a lot thicker. We're just gonna hang on a minute here. Let me get it through. Oh, hey, taking the cap off is important. All right, so this is gonna let me put a dollop of glue down inside this hole here and this hole is going to run over the top of this little indexing titty here. And that's going to go in like that. And we're going to line those arrows up. So this is just like a Model 12 shotgun. We're going to line them up. But now we know that that little bit of glue is in there and that this is for you to rotate. Each individual blade is going to get the same treatment. There's a hole. Let's see if I can cross like this hole. It doesn't matter. Just take, take my word for it. There's a hole right there. And we're going to put a little bit of cement down in it right there just a little bit because we don't want any cement on the outside of this boot anywhere and then we're going to line it up and slide it in now we didn't want to put so much cement on it that we got glue bubbling out of the inside of this thing because we don't want to lock this up so i didn't push it down all the way flush i pushed it down most of the way flush because i don't want to make that mistake so we do that four more times When a turbo shaft engine shuts down, the blades go to what's called a feather position. They go to a point where if they're rotating, they're not making any thrust. As you start adding power in a turbo shaft, these will come down to fine pitch while they're running on the ground. And then as the speed of the airplane starts to speed up, they will unload and the propellers will actually change pitch. This particular kit is pretty badass because it lets you display the prop at fine pitch or at full feather. Full feather is important because you may get to a place where you want to shut this engine down, but you don't want to be rotating the drivetrain. Let's say you had a lubrication failure. You're going to want this prop to not turn. Um, and it's mostly a lubrication issue and tearing up what's left of the engine. You shut it down for a reason, um, but you may not want to you know, tear it up any worse. So anyway, I think we got this. We're not going to exercise this too many more times because I want to let this glue set up. This casing belongs over here in this step, this gear, torsion meter pivot. These are the, the ring gear, the Sun and Planet setup. So um, um, here you go. I've gone ahead and already done this entire step. We've glued on the feathering solenoid, the thrust sensitivity switch, and the ring gear. Know that um, as you're doing all of this work in this turbine, you're trying to turn the propeller this way and the engine's trying to turn that way. And the difference is torque. And that's how we're gonna measure it. We're actually gonna twist. This long tube right here is actually gonna develop a twist and the bar on the inside of it will be going one way and it'll be going the other. And we'll know how much effort the engine's putting out. That's why all that matters. Okay, I've glued that piece in. Now we'll sit here. I've also glued in the base. 
and they want a little bit of oil. They want a little bit of oil right here. Okay, we'll just stick that over there. There we go. And then each one of these has to go on the thick stud here. Now they all want to hop off. So I'm figuring I'll just put a drop of oil on the top of each one of these studs here. And uh, we'll one, two, get up in there. Again, a low dexterity day being had by me. Three, and you're not gluing any of this, but this is all operational. I think it's a pretty cool model. Three, four. The idea being that all of this is going to rotate in one jump. You see all that's, that's moving there? That's there, and then they want us to take the rear planet carrier and glue it down over the top of this. So once again, we're going to use a glue that doesn't migrate around. We're just going to fill each one of these holes up with a drop of this. And let that styrene start to get a little bit wet. And then that should just hang on to all of this. Okay, so there we go. That goes there, 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 and there. All right. If I'm allowed to pull this off without anything getting weird, those should all turn, you see. And as this gets broken in and gets lubricated, this is a sun and planet gear set where we turn one end of it and the rest of it all turns for us. All right, let me make sure this is all together. Clamp, clamp, clamp. We got all that. We got all that flash off of it. We are golden. Okay, so that completes step eight. We've got seven done. And now what they're asking us to do is take this diaphragm, which is just a bearing holder, all right? Cement 26 on 27. So let's find part number 26. That's this gear right here. 26 on 27. I got to make sure I got that right. Okay. This is what they want us to do. There's a little drive pin there. I'm just making sure I've clarified what it is they want me to do here. Cement this gear onto this shaft. And by gum, that's what we did. Now, this has got to spin, so we got to make sure we didn't get any glue down in here. And since this is a non optical part, we can go ahead and, um, and uh, touch that with our fingers here. All right, here we go. So this, the, there's the light. Okay, 26 is now glued on 27. Uh, located as shown in drawing A. So there we go. That's going to go through the back of that plate right there as best as i can tell that sure looks like it right we're gonna put a little drop of oil in it because they're telling us to do that just a little drop of oil and ordinarily getting oil anywhere near a plastic kit is like death all right slide 27 through 28 we did that 27 through part number 28 the rear gear case we'll get right on up in here like this 20 says slide uh, 29 on to 30. 29 goes into 30. And that's going to spin like that, right? And then put take that part and stick that in there. And that's what they're asking for. And this is the part where they're telling us to go ahead and not glue it right off the bat. So let me get that up in there. That's there. This is here. And then boom, boom, boom. Okay. Finally, cement pin 31 into hole 28. Pin the 31 into the hole on 28. Okay, we can get back and do that. Part number 31 is the propeller control intermediate lever, and I didn't cut that out. So stand by for a moment. I'm going to go grab that. If we hadn't read this, if we hadn't read this, we would have now gone, hunted this part on the sprue, and then glued it in when we should have glued it in a long time ago. There's a little pin on it right there. So it looks like it goes right there and it's sticking out of the inside of this shaft. So that's cool. That will work. We will do that. But we're doing it before we glue the back of the casing on. So it's all about sequence. And it's the same thing 
you're working on automobiles, you're working on firearms, you're working on a lot of things, the, um, you have to have pre-read what you're doing. Okay, so now we've got all that. And this is the one now where they're going to want us to glue this to there. But we're not going to do that yet. We're going to put the door on. We're going to put the door on first. Now, they don't want you to get the glue anywhere near this door. And I understand that. But we're going to put this door on first. We're going to take this door. We're going to put that pin through. We're going to stuff that in there. Right there. So now we have... We can close up the cover to the gear case. We can open it up. And we're just not going to get any glue anywhere near it is what we're not going to do. So we can take a little spot of it and glue up here. And we'll just tack this case together and let it sit here and set up. And then we know we got it. We've oiled all the rotating stuff. So the glue can't really adhere to anything that rotates. So that's pretty cool, right? Glue a little bit right there. And a little bit down in there. All right. So I've glued all the rotating stuff. And this case will set up here. You can see as soon as that tacks up, we know we got it. Then we can come down over here and just make sure we don't get any glue under this hinge. And that was their whole point. Um, these instructions appear to have been written with the older, thicker polystyrene cement um, instructions. But since we're using the nice thin stuff and it just runs all over the place and immediately sets up, we don't have to uh, we don't have to worry about that. So there you go. There's our intermediate shaft. Then our sun and planets are going to go on the outside of it, which I think you're going to find pretty cool before cementing open gear case door. All right, now we can take all these final assemblies. Here now in number eleven, we've got um, we've got this case right here. Okay, and then when they said put a little bit of oil around the outside out here, like that. Do I care whether or not it's too much oil or not enough oil? Not really, but this is going to rotate inside there like that, and that's the sun and planet gear setup. All right, so we've lubed that, and then it wants us to do what? It wants us to take this particular Charlie assembly and shove it through. And we'll come right back to that um, once I get my act together here. The net effect of all of that previous work was to produce this right here, which is a, you can look down inside the, uh, the gearbox here and see, see the gears turning the, you know, the input power comes in from the engine and rotates all of this. But the thing that I find the coolest about it is the fact that we can make all the propeller blades change at the same time while it's rotating. This is neat. Now let's get into the suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. Let's get into suck and squeeze here, shall we? The input turbine section starts out with large, large blades and then works its way down to very, very, very small blades. So as the air is compressed, it takes up less volume and you don't need as much turbine bladage to do it. So the way this was set up is they had to start out, this is gonna be the final section of the turbine blading right here. And that's gonna be the final set with the really small blades. And this is the first set with the really large blades. And this is all just gonna to lock together into a great big stack. And this is gonna be the input blading spindle right here. So having said that, there's a lot of cutting to do, and I'm just going to cut them out and, uh, and drop them on. Here we go.
There you go. Now the instructions said to glue all that together while we were going. I wanted to mock it all up and make sure it worked. You'll notice here though that the turbine blades do get smaller as the air compresses from the left to the right in this view. All right, and then they want me to glue this back plate on it right here, part number 56. I'm going to smash all that together in an assembly and allow it to dry. We kind of skipped through this building this casing because my god was this a million parts a very well done kit um, in that every single one of these diaphragms here was individual and had to be individually glued in and aligned and they want this to have an inspection case so that it's open so that you can see what's going on kind of like that but you can't mold something that's more than 179 degrees in periphery so what they had us do was build the half round one here and then build the, the, the quarter round one there and glue it all together. So that cement here is this line. I did all that because it was tedious. It took me a good, I would say two hours to do this and it just isn't gonna fit onto a video. But when you're all done, this, this turbine is supposed to be able to turn in here. Hang on a minute, let's get the light really on that. Okay, so this turbine turns inside of this. It's really a fantastic uh, uh, kit. Their, 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 their injection molding was amazing. Okay, so we're out of that now. We've got the um, upper casing with the air pipes going across here. This was really vague. We just tacked these on because we don't know where the hell they're going to line up when everything else is shut. So we get down in here and we go housing and spray shield assembly. Okay, so now we're back to something else. That's a part right there. I mean, look at the look at the casting on that. They've got that oil pipe running over the top. That's pretty slick. We broke these two pieces off, and this sprue is now empty. And I said it in that tone of voice because you don't really know if this sprue is empty or not. So you never throw your old sprues away. You just leave them. You leave them you may want to have to go look after them so we're all done now all the blues all the sprues are done we've got nothing here left in blue so now i have to ask the question where in the hell did part number 105 get off to it's not on the sprues we can inspect them where did it go so that leads me to the next thing that you never do never throw your packing materials away because I got news for you. Part number 105, we had to pick it up off the floor. Part number 105 was mud catting down inside that bag, right? Here we go. That looks an awful lot like that little pieces part right there, right? Don't throw away your sprues till you're all the way done. And don't throw away any of your packing materials until you know for a fact you've got the whole kit. Okay, that's step number 17 done. So now we've got the entire compressor section done. We've got the power output section. We've got the compressor section done. Uh, this thing is not exactly a mini-me. I'm going to tell you what. This is turning into a very large kit. All right, let's make some power. 
we're on assembly 18 here. We have the six spray bars that are going to spray into the six fire cans. And then we also have the uh, fuel piping that goes around and pressurizes all of those. So this is one of those deals where you've got to have all of the flash clipped off of this or it's not going to work right. Because there's no, um, there's a lot of model making that goes on in some of this. And they don't just hook in there the right way. You've got to have all this flash off of these. So what this sprayer does is the same thing that a, car, a fuel injection nozzle does on a reciprocating engine. It just introduces fuel into a low pressure area in the burner can. A uh, little known fact that the, the mixture ratio in a jet engine, if you look at the entire engine, the mixture ratio is about 130 to one, but right in the area of the fire cans, it's 14 to 1, 14.7 to 1. So you have a lot of extra oxygen available inside of a jet engine. And that's why when you when you get on the back end of it, you can stick an afterburner on it, dump a little more fuel into the back end and and have um, and, and have you know what? I just did that wrong. I'm sitting here running my mouth and I did it wrong. So this nozzle sticks in this way and it glues up here uh, see I should have test fit this so that nozzle should be sticking out like that right there and there's six of these bad boys so I'm gonna go around and glue them in but of course now I've got glue on my fingers so this is gonna make for an absolute mess until I can get myself loose from this there we go okay let me just press this down here with something So I did, I did mess this up. Okay. They want all these nozzles facing to the rear. And that makes sense now because now the little thing that takes this fuel hose is actually sitting to the rear. So it makes sense. So we'll just uh, stick the rest of these bad boys in there. We'll drop them in like this and then we'll use the real thin glue. So what I had noticed when I was building this was that there's a set of alignment lines out here that'll actually hang on to this for you. That we use the real thin, really quick set glue. Go ahead and uh, suck those up like that. There we go. So there's the spray nozzles blowing back into the ring. Kind of what, what they were talking about up here in this. And then we flip this thing over. They're showing it on this side. And then they're showing that this little alignment hit goes right there. And this then is the, um, the rotor bearing plate because all this rotating mass has got to spin on something. So I'm going to bring this up from the inside and I'm just going to run the glue on from the inside and let the capillary action just suck that around the corner. You are constantly fighting the fact that this plastic even no matter how well the the kit is made this plastic still bends and winds and pops and does whatever it wants to do so you're constantly going back and realigning keeping the glue off of your fingers and doing all this now i think i was supposed to put that fuel manifold on first i also think that because this is an open-ended part i'm going to be able to get away with doing it kind of one at a time here there are certain key parts in any kit build where vagaries of instructions and things get you into some trouble here. And I'm trying to not glue myself into a corner. So as I previously mentioned, this case is made up of the big piece and the little piece that come all the way around. But when they told me to glue this pressure plate on, I should have glued this on at 45 degree angles and I didn't. So I've had to come back now and cut these off. And the reason why I've had to cut them off and sand them smooth is the next thing here they want us to do is glue this case on. And there are an alignment, there's an alignment feature here and there's another alignment feature right there, which is very obviously supposed to catch these two alignment features right here. And there's another one right, uh, let me get that lined up into the camera for you, right there you can see that notch. 
So it's pretty obvious that it's supposed to go together this way, but it wasn't. It was tiptoeing off to the end and it was really screwing everything up. So now I got it there, it'll still turn. And let's see here, it felt like, yep, one of my nozzles is still a little bit loose because every time I touch this thing, I'm pressing on it and it hasn't gotten hard yet. And I don't know, I put a little bit of heat on it. I don't know what it's gonna to take to get out of there, but just understand that this gets a little dodgy. But the next thing they wanted us to do is glue that right there. And then we're gonna to have to come back in and glue this end of the casing on here. And be very, very careful that you're not allowing the glue to touch anything that rotates. We'll allow that thin set polystyrene to just clamp down on this and hang on. And once we get it tacked in, you don't have to hold this model together by much. It's not, you're not pulling any torque with it. It's not going to be flight qualified. It's not going on a model aircraft. We just have to be sure that we don't um, just tack it all together and make sure that it still is free to rotate. And this is, I've seen other gentlemen use Vaseline to um, lubricate this. I'm just using the gun oil because, well, I'm a gunsmith and that's what I have available. All right, so the rest of this is just going to be gluing. We're now going to make all the accessory casings and all the other fancy stuff that sits on the outside of this. So this is just cut, dehorn, and, uh, and, and, and lock on. You might be noticing I'm not gluing these on here very hard. I just want them to stick around because we have angles. We have all kinds of things that I'm, I'm, I will admit that I'm probably doing wrong. So I'm trying to leave myself a way out as we come back in later with other, other piping. I can see that this other pipe here on this duct is going to have to go down and go from there to there. We'll make it all fit. All right. The next thing they want us to do now is, is drop this in. And that will drop right in to here. Again, full disclosure, I test fit all of this stuff before I even started the camera rolling because I'm trying to not uh, bum dope you guys. All right, there's an alignment tab right there. There's an alignment tab right there. We roll it up, we pop it on, and we bend another fuel nozzle. Just be really careful. I, we will be lucky if all of these fuel nozzles make it into the final model because you want to put some axial thrust on this thing to hang on to it. You want to clamp it and all you're doing is screwing up. This kit um, was around in 1960. I hadn't been born for another two years yet. So this was probably an extremely high speed kit back in the day. They say it's for a level three builder and I don't claim any proficiency when it comes to working on uh, model kits. However, I would tell you this is a hell of a lot more than a level three kit. The ability of an internal combustion engine to make power is entirely dependent upon your ability to ram oxygen into a cylinder. So we look at the early internal combustion engines here and they had a piston and a cylinder and they had valves and the valves allowed air and fuel to come in and exhaust products to go out okay so as this is running up and down the piston comes to the bottom and it creates a finite amount of space inside here it lowers the pressure below atmospheric pressure and fuel and air flow in and bang off it goes. As it does that, it, liber it liberates energy from the, the stored chemical energy in the fuel and turns it into thermal kinetic energy, which is then exerted on this piston, which produces mechanical energy. All right, what's the problem with this rig? While you're down on the ground and you're only powering automobiles in the 1890s, 1900s, you don't really notice the fact that as you begin to go up in the atmosphere, the amount of oxygen that's available goes down. 
So we get to a point coming right out of World War I where the service altitude of an aircraft is limited by how much power this thing can produce at five or 6,000 feet. Okay, how do we go higher? And trust me, they wanted to go higher. 1919, 1920, 1921, a series of experiments were performed where they basically put an air compressor on the front end of this thing and they drove it off the, off the shaft. So mechanical energy is coming off. We're making mechanical energy. We're running a blower, call it whatever you want to call it, but they call that a supercharger. So I'm just going to call that a supercharger. Okay. As opposed to say a subcharger, super means above. This is nice, it's heavy. It has a gear or chain drive. It's heavy, but it does work. There are limits to this though, where the amount of power that this thing consumes will ultimately get to the point where you're taking as much power to drive it as you're getting, and there you are, you're done. But you have succeeded in ramming many, in more air in. Um, if for, for 30 to 40 years prior to this, there was a concept called compounding where you would run the exhaust steam out of a triple expansion engine through a turbine back through a fluid coupling. I believe that was called a Bauer walk system. So somebody said, why don't we compound this engine? Now compounding has been done at various times in various ways. The obvious uh, champion of compounding would be the R3350, which had three parts recovery turbines on the back end of it, taking all the valves that you've dissolved because of the power you're making and blowing them in. All right, so right now we're taking thermal kinetic energy in the exhaust and the energy is going down this way onto the crankshaft, back up that way into the supercharger. Hmm, so this is turbo compounding. All right, well, you know, we've made it all the way right up to 1923. So what's going on? The very first steam engines operated below atmospheric pressure. They would uh, squirt some steam in there and then they would let it condense and the atmosphere would push the piston down. And you're running at about 200 degrees. So we're just gonna stay up here and we're gonna write this number up here where we can all see it. 200 degrees are the first steam engines, okay? A metallurgy, we were using brass, we were using copper, we are using solder. So one of Watt's first uh, uh, pumping engines for removing water only made about 10 horsepower and it consumed an enormous amount of fuel to do it. But at that particular time, they were more interested in the work it was doing. Let's move on up here now. The internal combustion engine runs at about a thousand degrees give or take depending upon and this is all degrees fahrenheit okay runs at about a thousand degrees you have steel liners iron pistons brass rings there were all kinds of, of things that were done and in order to make these engines go to higher and higher powers so you're rolling out of world war one with the with the liberty engine making about it's a 12 cylinder engine making about 450 horsepower and the hottest parts of it are getting up to about a thousand degrees. Well, trust me, it did not take long for some smart fool to say, why do we have to drag all of this superfluous mechanical weight around? Why don't we just drive the supercharger with the turbo compounder? And now we have turbo supercharging, right? Everybody's heard of this. Everybody's heard of turbo supercharging. You can supercharge or you can compound or you can just turbo supercharge. Well, again, it took about, I don't know, five minutes for a gentleman by the name of von Ohain in Germany and Whittle in England to realize that the redundant part of this entire setup is the piston engine. The piston engine is redundant. It vibrates, it shakes, it does all kinds of things. 
let's just inject the fuel and burn it. Let's just burn the fuel. And when you're doing that, you have a turbo jet. Now, turbo jets work by sucking a large amount of air into the front end of them, compressing this air, injecting fuel into it. The fuel burns, expands, and makes the volume of the air change dramatically. We steal a little bit of that energy that we create, and we spin the compressor with it. This is continuous. It doesn't produce um, pulses in torque. And it produces the back end, and we measure what's coming out the back end of that is thrust. Now, this particular engine now, you've got to have compounds that can take temperatures upwards 3,500 degrees. So what was really holding engine development back from about 1880 out to about World War II was the fact that metallurgists were blowing their brains out trying to keep up with all this temperature. But the hotter, the larger the difference between source, the air coming in, and the sink, the air going out, the more thrust you produce. But turbojets are not very efficient at low levels because the turbojet does not know how thick the air is it's breathing, but it knows how hard it has to push the airplane. So the only way to lean out in a turbojet-powered aircraft is to go up, right? Okay, well... Somebody then, in the middle of all this, we get rid of this engine, we get rid of everything. We can actually take some of this exhaust energy that's coming out the back end of this, duct it up through a shaft and through a set of gears here, turn a propeller. Or turn a set of helicopter blades, or turn a screw on a boat, or turn the wheels on a on a car and what you particularly have there now is a turbo prop and that's what we have up here in the model we take air we drag it in we compress it here in the in in the uh, compressor we inject fuel into the combustion chambers we burn that fuel and blow it out over these turbines now this particular turbine has only got one spool okay let me bring this up to the front it's only got one spool on it. So the same shaft that's turning the turbine blades and recovering the power is also spinning the propeller. As we said earlier, the propeller's pitch can be changed to deal with the forward velocity of the aircraft. There's a lot of things going on there. Eventually, this went to a two, two and sometimes a three spool setup where one of these turbine blades and the air compressor is just running essentially as a turbojet producing gas for a free spinning turbine this is why you can hear a helicopter will spool all the way up and the blades are just starting to spin this thing when you roll this thing to start it up you're rolling the whole thing you're rolling the propeller you're rolling everything but that's essentially what we have here and in a piston engine you would call the intake stroke suck the compression stroke squeeze, the, the power stroke bang, and the exhaust stroke blow, and we got it all right here. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, but it's continuous and it doesn't produce any uh, vibration. Now, the ultimate extrapolation of this is you take a propeller about this big, put about seven or eight of them out here, and put a huge duct over the front of that, and you wind up with a tur uh, turbo fan. Turbo fans are, have proven to be the most efficient way to do this. Um, you'll notice that they have a hot section, a small part, and an enormous duct. And the big ones growl when they run because there's a very low note coming out the front of them. Well, anyway, that's kind of my take. After this, the only place left to go is a straight rocket where all you do is burn the fuel. But just, and you bring the oxidizer along with you. But it still takes a tremendous amount of power to run one of these compressors or on a rocket motor in order to run the fuel pumps, which are epic. Anyway, that's my take on that. I hope you, I hope you picked up something from it. Well, there you have it. 
Atlantis has rebranded an old Ravel kit from 1960, which is two years before I was born, which is out of the way back, Sherman. But they've rebranded this kit. <clears throat> we did a quick and dirty build here. Um, I didn't, you know, totally stick around too long, but it's functional. I mean, I have to loosen it up a little bit, but it does work and it is pretty epic. And back in the early 60s, this thing was motorized, which would have been insane. They're trying to hold tolerances inside of a kit like this that would be difficult to hold if it was made out of metal. So personally, I think they did a good job with it. I would recommend it. Um, the minute Bruno found this thing, at a, and he found it at a Hobby Lobby, I'm like, oh, hell yeah, go back in and buy that. So as always, um, it's been a pleasure, and I just wanted to show you something different, and I hope you enjoyed it. Take care, guys.